Before I get going today, how many of you were at the memorial yesterday? <clears throat> um, you know, I don't know. I, I spent a lot of time, I don't even know if I should talk about this, but what the heck. It's kind of how I taught in my classroom too, but uh, I don't know. So I, I listened to this, this talk of Ken, and I knew Ken. Ken's the reason why we came to this church, um, and uh, got to got to spend time with Ken. Um, Ken was a great man. He really was a great man. Uh, and I don't know that I have a desire to be a great man. I have a desire to be a good man. Um, but he was a great man. He had the capacity, I think, um, divinely blessed to share the gospel, divinely blessed to preach the gospel. Um, and um, I was really struck by the letter that he wrote yesterday. So if, for those of you who weren't there, our former pastor, um, his time here ended in 2009, um, died recently um, of, of dementia and um, I think uh, some, yeah, lymphoma, some struggle with lymphoma. lymphoma. And... Um, he got apparently pretty bad. Didn't wasn't able to fully recognize people at the end. Wasn't able to string together sentences at the end. Couldn't put thoughts together. And I don't know when he wrote this letter, but I had the sense the way they were talking about it that it was pretty late. And in the, in the last year, that's it. it was in the last year. Like that is amazing to me. So he wrote this letter in the last year which was a letter to the people. It was essentially like a mini-sermon to the people that would come to his funeral. I'm going to try and get a copy of it. Um, it was phenomenal. Um, a, a call for people to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. It was absolutely incredible. The guy couldn't put sentences together. But God can. But God can. It was incredible. And they didn't even, the family didn't even know it existed. It was in the safe. He'd written it and put it in the safe within the last year. Um, and it was it was just incredible. I'm going to try and get a copy. If I do, um, I'm going to see if Tim will let me distribute it. I, I That's something that we can all do. We can all have that kind of an impact on others for the gospel. Okay. A um, couple of things. I know we have some new folks this morning. Uh, I give you my notes, essentially. <clears throat> They're a little briefer. Yours are eight pages, mine are 12. Um, well, mine are also a little bigger. So I don't have to put these on. But um, I, uh, I give you those so that you can have them, so that you can use them, um, do what you want with them, but just understand that those are my notes. And so... Um, I tell you that only because I want you to understand. You'll see me and you'll be like, why did he give me his manuscript for what he's talking about? That's why. I just want you to have those. Um, we're going to start here reading Romans 6. Do we have a volunteer whose name is my brother Brian to read chapter 6, verses 1 to 14? I do. Thank you for being volunteer. All right. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ uh, were baptized into his death? <coughs> we were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been, I'm sorry, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. 
So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for right unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Thank you, Brian. Okay, so again, I include at the beginning of, of your outline the stuff that I, that's been there from the beginning. Right, an outline of where we're going uh, with, a, with an eye to where we are. Uh, and I want to stress for you again, Romans 1, 16 to 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. This is Paul's magnum opus of the gospel. It is his presentation of the gospel. And that's a really, really important point. Um, it leads to a proper interpretation of the entire letter. Okay, um, and, and we've talked a lot about that. And so, um, as we look back over where we've come, from whence we've come, I don't remember who that is. Do you remember? Okay, good. He's the English guy. So, anyway, uh, beginning in Romans 1, verse 18, we have this idea of the depravity of man. And we see that taught in Romans 1, Romans 2, Romans 3. And then you have the presentation of the gospel by Paul in Romans 3, which is um, rooted in the idea of justification, justification through faith alone, sola fide. And again, I want to stress for you, like we're doing in church, we, this is, we're coming up on Reformation Day. What day is Reformation Day? <coughs> yeah, we should do that instead of Halloween. I told my daughter we should do that. What do you think? I think that'll go over well. That, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's going to go over real well. But we should. We should celebrate Reformation Day. Reformation Day and the five solas of the Reformation. Again, not mentioned in the Reformation. It was a study tool for after the Reformation um, as we look back on it. But sola scriptura, the idea of by scripture alone. Solus Christus through Christ alone. Sola fide by faith alone. Sola gratia by grace alone. And soli deo gloria to the glory of God alone. The five solas of the Reformation. Like if you could pin those five, those five concepts down. They are both the, what divides us, what differentiates us between the Protestant and the Catholic Church. But more importantly... Those things are the gospel. But, I mean, sola scriptura is, of course, where we find the gospel, right? But the gospel message is included there. And we forget the soli deo gloria part is the gospel. You are not saved to your glory. You are not the hero of scripture. You are saved to God's glory alone. And so just keep that in mind. As we look through this idea, we look through justification, when we look through sanctification, the constant theme that is woven throughout all of this is the idea that this occurs to God's glory. And again, I just believe that um, the more we can drill that from our head into our heart, the more we can live the idea that everything we do is done to God's glory. The simplest verse in 1 Corinthians, right, whether you eat or whether you drink, do, all, do it all to the glory of God. The simplest verse um, that often gets overlooked, and yet it, is, it should be what drives us in everything that we do. And it certainly is what drives God and what He does to His own glory. Okay? All right. So again, the idea of justification through faith alone. And so we've then been in this next section, chapter 5, verse 1, till chapter 8, verse 39, which is the assurance provided by the gospel, the hope of salvation. 
And so we're now in the second component there, which is freedom from, from the bondage of sin. <laughs> freedom from bondage to sin. That's where we're moving, and you'll see that that's bolded there. I do want to point out a couple of things. And, and by the way, do we need to go through justification again? Do we, do we understand what justification is? Justification is a forensic thing. It is a forensic ruling by God that you are no longer guilty. It is a forensic, forensic ruling that you have been made righteous through the work of Jesus Christ. It is the picture of a judge in a courtroom. Okay? That's a very, very important concept. And it is important today that we understand that because we will be talking about sanctification and the two are distinct. Justification is not sanctification. Justification is a forensic ruling that you are not guilty. You have been acquitted through no work of your own. Solely through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross on your behalf. God looks at Christ and renders you not guilty. Okay? Very important we understand that doctrine. And by the way, also very important to understand, how do you access justification? By faith. That's it. By faith. There is nothing that you can do to achieve justification apart from simply faith. And when we start talking about the verbs that are used and the tenses that are used, justification occurred when? When Jesus died. Eternity passed. You were declared justified by God before the cornerstone of the world was laid. I'll let you work that into your theology however you want. Whether you like it or not, that's what Scripture tells us. So. Where does it say that? Uh, throughout. Okay. We can talk about the tenses later if you want, Virginia. Okay. But it's throughout. The, the idea of an aorist uh, indicative, which is a um, verb tenses, throughout that discussion of justification, all of those tenses point to the idea of something that happened in the past. Okay, so we'll come back and we can talk about that later if you want. But justification, super important you understand that doctrine. Because it is distinct from sanctification, which we will get into today. Uh, again, justification is accessed only by faith. So if you'll skip to Roman numeral 4, the hope provided by the gospel... You know, when you study Pauline literature, okay, you study Paul's writing, uh, really in all of his letters, he has a tendency to teach a theological principle or set of principles, and then he dives into unity, and after diving in, why do you suppose that follows the teaching of theological principles? What do we do as soon as we get taught a theological principle? Break it. We immediately divide. divide over it, don't we? Yeah. Right? Like, you have this view of it, I have that view of it, and here comes the division. Right? So I think it's fascinating. In almost every Pauline letter, certainly any of any length, Paul teaches theological principles and then follows it with a call to unity. Which may speak to the significance of unity in the church. Right? And then after his call to unity, he applies that. We see that in Romans. But in Romans, you see two things that you don't see as much in other Pauline literature. One is this tremendous beacon of hope that we see in chapters 5 to 8. Okay? Um, and we'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, in chapters 9, 10, 9 and 10, and at least... I think some of 11. Um, Paul then also talks about, well, what about the, the Jewish people? What about them? 
right? If, if God has been faithful um, in Christ to believers in Christ, what about the Jewish people? Was he faithful to them? And so Paul then dives into that. And then he gets into the unity and application. Okay? So that's, I think, an interesting addition. But we're in this, this very rich section of hope, and we spent a lot of time on chapter 5, as shocking as that is. Um, and you'll remember a couple of things here. You will remember uh, that Paul talks about these two realms. This comes into play in chapter 6 as well. He talks about the realm of Adam, which um, is a, a reign or a rule or a sphere in which Adam initiates through his sin. Okay? And it is marked by all sinning and all dying. And then there's a second reign, a second sphere, a second realm. And that realm is marked by the action of obedience of Christ going to the cross. And righteousness reigns in that sphere. Okay, and so Paul is contrasting these two spheres um, throughout chapter 5. That's really important for chapter 6, so I want to remind you of that. Most important in this section, I want to remind you the two capstone verses. So if you have your Bible, it's in your notes here. You could just look here. Um, but in, if you have your Bible, you might mark these verses. Okay? Um, but they're certainly in your notes. Roman numeral 4 there. Um, Romans 5, verse 1. Romans 5, verse 1. I don't know... I don't know that we fully comprehend what Paul says in chapter 5, verse 1. I don't know that we fully realize what has happened for us in chapter 5, verse 1. Here's what Paul says. Therefore, so because of this teaching on justification that I've just done, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace and with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you recognize in your life what peace with God entails? Do you recognize in your life? And the answer for everyone in here should be no, not to the extent that I should, at a minimum. But do you recognize the animosity that you had towards God? You hated God before you were saved. You did not. You weren't okay with God. You hated God before you were saved. Clear scripturally. You detested Him. You wanted nothing to do with Him. The creator of the universe... The author of your salvation. And you hated him before you were saved. And if you don't believe that, I strongly encourage you to go back and read Romans 1-3. through 3, Because that defined who you, were, who you were before you were saved. And I don't think we fully understand the measure of what God has done for us without fully understanding the extent to which we hated God before salvation. That's a bold statement. But I think it's true. Um, I, I would suggest, I've been a Christian for a long time. I've been a Christian since third grade. And I did dumb things and I said, don't get me wrong, I did some pretty stupid stuff growing up. But I have known God's favor since third grade. Some of you have not. Right? Some of you um, um, were saved at a much later time in your life. You probably have a much better understanding of how much you hated God than, than I do. I think there's just a reality to that. Um, but I would urge you to think about that. Because I think contrast brings clarity. Write that down in your notes. Contrast brings clarity. 
Contrast brings clarity. I think when we understand how much you, we truly hated God, this verse should move us nearly to tears. John, on the night that I was saved, the words that came out of my mouth as I was on my knees in front of my couch. Josh, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, on the night that I was saved, I was on my knees in front of my couch, and I told God I didn't want to fight with him anymore. But that I also understood that I deserved help. Absolutely had it done. And I knew that. And I asked him to take the hatred out of my heart and the gun out of my hand. So yeah, I understand you. I hoped you would you would share that. Uh, if you've never heard John's testimony, I would encourage you to bump into him. <laughs> Maybe not physically. <laughs> He's a big guy. Uh, his testimony is, is incredible. Um, and, uh, I, you know, obviously I don't, like for my own daughter, I wish she didn't go, you know, I would hope she doesn't go through a tremendous um, life of not um, submitting to God. Uh, but, I'm telling you, like there is something in that. Now, I think that God reveals to us what we need also, right? And so, I would just urge you to spend the time um, thinking about how you were before and how you are now. Whatever that looks like for you. Um, because I think that contrast is super, super important. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have peace and you don't deserve it. In fact, if it were up to you, you would continue in your hatred towards God. But God reached into your life. God revealed Himself to you. God reached into humanity. He should have, could have, not should have, could have just wiped us out. We would deserve it. But God reached into our humanity and saved us. And now we can say with Paul that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And how great is that peace? Skip to Romans 8. Go to Romans 8. Paul is talking about this. In Romans 8.18, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And in verse 30, And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. And then He injects at the end of chapter 8 this incredible hymn of praise. And in this, this hymn of praise, He's talking about the security that we have. The hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says this in chapter 8, verse 38. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor the election, nor COVID, nor the vaccine. You name it. Not the trauma that occurred in your life. Not the trauma that may occur in your life. <coughs> For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have peace with God. And there's nothing that can take you away from that. I've got a lot of good friends that are Arminian. I've got good friends that, that go to Arminian churches here in town. And I love them. But I don't get them. 
I'm so thankful that I know that nothing can separate me from the love of God. I am not going to go home and screw up and have to go seek salvation again. Why? Because Christ has already created peace. I mean, it's here. Just read it. Sealed. Nothing can separate us. We are sealed. And we're going to talk about that seal as we look in chapter 6. The idea that we are sealed with Christ by being buried with Him. Like, man, love this and own this and, and take this thing to the bank. But stay confessing. Confess because we desire. We, re we respond with a desire to be holy as God is holy. And so we do confess, absolutely. Yeah. We confess because we recognize that we're not doing what we're called to do. But we confess with the knowledge and the comfort that we are saved and nothing can separate us from God. John. Romans 8, 1 and 2 are my salvation verses. It says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from all law of sin and death. I don't know why we want to return. Amen. Amen, John. Thank you. Okay, so important we understand this, important we understand those two realms. And now we look into chapter 6. And I'm going to start with some introduction here to chapter 6. Um, again, this is mostly from Moo's commentary, Douglas Moo. Um, but as we look at this idea of freedom from bondage to sin, salvation, so I'm on Roman numeral 5, salvation through grace by faith leads to a new relationship with God and provides assurance of salvation from wrath. That is eschatological. It is in the future. Okay? What about today? Great. We have this eschatological salvation. What about today? We will be made holy. We will be glorified. But what about today? And so Paul dives into that in chapter 6. Christ's death frees us, and this is important. Please note the underlined th um, words in your notes on B there, Roman numeral 5. Christ's death frees us not only from the penalty of sin, that's the judgment piece, right? The justification. But the power of sin as well. That is the doctrine of sanctification. Romans 6 focuses on subduing the power of sin. Focuses on subduing the power of sin. And you have the notes here, Paul uses sin in the singular in Romans 6. Um, but notice that there's, there is this slavery freedom language. We're enslaved to sin. Sin... Uh, as a master. Sin is tyrannical. Salvation is freedom. So you'll see that and you'll see those, the, those, those words that, the, that represent imagery that Paul is using here. But we are free. We are free from the tyranny of sin. We are free from the lordship of sin. That was an interesting thing. Uh, and I, we may get into this some at the end today, uh, but we've talked about it before. So, so briefly, let me just kind of go back to this. Um, there was this huge debate, okay, huge debate within theological circles. Um, John MacArthur, right before I went to Masters, wrote this book called The Gospel According to Jesus. And in the Gospel according to Jesus, MacArthur basically said this. If you claim to be a Christian and you don't act like a Christian, you should check whether or not you're a Christian. Somehow, that was like dropping a nuclear bomb. Like, the war started. And... and Good men like Charles Ryrie. Many of you probably have a Ryrie study Bible. Mm -hmm. 
Good men like Charles Ryrie accused MacArthur, who's a Calvinist, of work salvation by saying that. Now, how you can be a Calvinist and be into work salvation, I don't know. Like, it's the, the exact opposite of each other. And yet, that was the accusation. And so, man, book after book after book was written to refute MacArthur's The Gospel According to Jesus. Okay, it was, it was mind-blowing. Now, MacArthur, I think, probably went a little far at times. If you've ever read MacArthur, he's pretty good at doing that. <laughs> and I don't necessarily mean that in the positive. Okay, I think MacArthur tends to overshoot the mark a little with the idea that he's going to pull the argument to the mark. Uh, and I don't know how comfortable I am entirely with that. John, if you're watching... <laughs> I apologize, but I don't. Um, so there's a reality to that, okay? Well, what happened is, as is common, right? As soon as you get some division, both sides begin to really refine where they stand. And the Ryrie Hodges group began to really refine where they stood. And they're a part of this group that became... That was already known, but this became a, a, an integral part of what's called the free grace movement. Okay? And the free grace movement is the idea of sola gratia. It started well. But the free grace movement suggests that sanctification doesn't actually have to happen. That you can be justified divorced from being sanctified. Now we'll talk about sanctification, the already but not yet components of sanctification. Positional versus progressive versus ultimate. It's all there in your notes. We'll go through it. But understand that the concept, what happened here, is that there was a division between justification and sanctification. Now, MacArthur would not say to you that it's his business to judge whether or not you're saved. That was the other thing. People felt really judged by it. But what MacArthur would say is if you are walking in a lifestyle of sin, you should check yourself. Amen. Well, I would actually say that's actually really, really sound advice. Like if, if you aren't walking with God, you should ask, Am I with God? Amen. Like, that's a good thing for you to do. But somehow that got turned on its head, and there was more. It became a dispensational argument versus... I mean, it was, it was wild to watch. And there were people in the background, like me, that were like, why are we fighting? How is the... I mean, have you read 1 John? That's what 1 John's about. Well, where is the part where we're instructed how we confront people, restore them gently? We're supposed to. That doesn't sell book, books, Virginia. <laughs> well, <laughs> except in the Bible, it's, it's in there. Well. And you don't get, you don't, lots of times you're not going to get great feedback or get you might yeah. even, like Proverbs says, you might even get a blot. Listen, I'm not going to defend MacArthur in that regard because I think MacArthur also does that to an extreme. Okay, but I will tell you, in this case, I think MacArthur's point is solid. You do not forfeit your salvation because you sin. You don't even forfeit your salvation because you live habitual sin. Why? How do we know that? You can't forfeit your salvation. What do you forfeit? You forfeit your assurance. Your sense of assurance. I don't know if I'm saved because I'm not living the lifestyle. That's what you forfeit. And by the way, you should. That's a really important point. So this all occurs. And we'll get to uh, Romans 6 verse 1. Really, Paul's dealing with something called antinomianism. And I would argue that a lot of us are functional antinomians. That was very convicting. Okay? I would argue that a lot of us are functional antinomians. Um, antinomian is the idea, well, I'm saved, I can do what I want. No, you can't. 
What would give you such an idea? That God cares so little about your holiness that He sent His Son to die on a cross, but He doesn't care if you're obedient? What would give you that idea? What kind of God do you think you serve? Antinomianism is dangerous, but I would argue that many of us become, or have become at some point in our lives, functional antinomians. And we'll get into this later. We'll talk about the, the libertine mentality. Because there is this freedom versus um, grace question. Okay, so we'll get into that later. But, we are free from the tyranny of sin. And I got on to this point because the idea of sin's lordship is fascinating because what did they accuse MacArthur's thing of? What did they call it? Do you remember? Lordship salvation. salvation. I'll take that any day. I'll take lordship salvation over the lordship of sin any day. I thought that was pretty interesting as I read through this. Because Boo talks at great length about the idea of sin reigning. Well, what does lordship mean? It means something is your Lord. And again, I would argue we don't fully understand that language living in a democracy. We don't, we don't understand the idea of humbling yourself before the throne. It's also a refusal to give up, you know, just replace rebellion with sin because that's what it is. You're, you're literally saying, I'm still going to rebel. You know, I'm God. I, I'm going to do what I want. Though, I'm going to take what God has given me and I'm still going to do what I want to do. Yep. That's all it is. Yep. Amen. What was he accused of? Lordship what? Salvation. Well, okay, they called it Lordship Salvation. Okay. Which it's weird. seems biblical. But. Okay, so we have been transferred from the realm of Adam, characterized, the realm of Adam is, characterized by the reign of sin, to the realm of Christ, characterized by the reign of righteousness. There is clear transferal language here. We have been transferred from one realm to the next. By the way, notice you didn't jump from one realm to the next. You were transferred. You were something that was acted upon, not something that acted. That is interesting too, right? So, what does this mean? Well, negative, from in the negative sense, you are free from the power of sin. I don't mean that to say... It is negative, but you're freed from the power of sin. But in the positive sense, you're now dedicated to righteousness. And that's actually the division that Paul makes here in chapter 6. Verses 1 to 14 is you're freed from the slavery, the bondage of sin. And uh, verse 15 to 23 um, are then now, what should you do with that? Well, you're dedicated now to a life of righteousness. So justification brings with it a new power that has led and must lead to a new way of life. Justification has brought with it a new power that has led and must lead to a new way of life. You're hopefully catching what I just did there. It has it has happened already. And it must lead to, it must still happen. So as we get into the idea of sanctification, it's really important that you understand that sanctification has this, it's already happened, it needs to happen, it's going to happen mentality in it. Okay? And you'll see that in your notes as we go. But... And I love this quote, justification, acquittal from the guilt of sin, this is from Moo, and sanctification, deliverance from sinning, must not be confused, but neither can they be separated. I read a long journal article at midnight last night um, from a guy at Master's Seminary who was talking about the need for us to understand the distinction between progressive <laughs> sanctification, being made more holy like, like God is holy, right, that process, um, and the ideas of justification. Progressive sanctification 
and, and also positional sanctification. Like we need to understand those concepts and we can't mix them up because it leads to problems, but neither can we divorce them because that leads to problems. We need to maintain a unity between the three. And so I'm a nerd and that's what I was doing at midnight last night and I'll share some of that with you. Yeah. I, I think something that would be important to add to this is um, like having a healthy fear of the Lord, you know, the knowledge, the beginning of knowledge is the fear of the Lord. Yep. Because you got to have a knowledge of sin to understand sanctification, like the Proverbs 1 states. Yeah, amen. Well said. Yep. Fear the Lord, absolutely. Okay, so transfer to the new realm of Christ from the old realm of Adam does not end the influences of previous sinful impulses, habits, or temptations, right? We are still in the what? We're still in the flesh. We're still in the flesh. You're still going to have sinful temptations. Okay? Some of those temptations are societal. Some of those temptations are memory of what you've done in the past. Right? You still have temptations. You will still give in to those temptations. And by the way, don't say you don't. Because that's a sign of not being saved. Right? First John 1. If you say you have no sin, you're what? You're a liar. And the truth is not in you. So don't say you don't. You still have desires to sin and you still give in to those desires. Okay? So, uh, we're transferred to the new realm, but we're still in the flesh. These vestiges of the old realm serve as a constant thread to putting into actual practice the realities of the new realm status. These threats from the old realm will remain until the eschatological resurrection and transformation of the body. We'll get into that later. The reality is apparent in Paul's use of pairing indicative and imperative combinations. What is an indicative, Brian? Don't answer. Thank you, teacher. He should know that. It indicates something. It does, actually. That's exactly what it means. Okay? I, I asked Angie to share because we learned this a couple of weeks ago. But Angie? She's, anyway, she's you're not, not going to. She's not come on, oh, Angie. Come on. come on! Okay. So, indicative is a mood of verbs that expresses a statement of fact. By the way, when it's combined with aorist verbs, it is a statement of fact that happened when? In the past. That is really important when we start talking translation. So indicative, a mood of verbs that expresses something that happened. The imperative is a mood of verbs that expresses a command. So Paul marries these throughout this passage. It was brilliant. Oh, incredible. I don't know that we fully understand how incredibly brilliant Paul was. And then you add to that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Like, but it is absolutely brilliant. So here's what he does. Here are a couple of these examples. Sin will not rule over you. That is an indicative statement. Right? It's just a statement of fact. Sin is not going to rule over you. But then what is the imperative that comes with it? Do not let sin reign. It won't rule over you. Don't let it rule over you. And he combines that throughout Romans 6. And we see it again here. You are not in the flesh. You're not in the flesh. You're sanctified. You're not in the flesh. Don't be in the flesh. Right? So there's this combination in Paul of these indicative imperative statements. Okay? All right, let's move into sanctification. We'll do what we can here. Lord have mercy. I thought I was going to. All right. Sanctification, yes, ma'am. Do you think that Paul was as brilliant as he was? Because he was out there at the temples, and he says, and every time before he had his Damascus Road experience, he was he was out there arguing for the faith, and so it got he was practicing for the time 
he was already working on this and preparing for the time when the Damascus Road, and then he was able to put all of this like this together. But he was doing what he was, I guess, what he was supposed to be doing because well, he, he was, was, he was, was a, a Jew. He was a Pharisee, he? He was a Pharisee right? Who studied at the knee of Gamaliel, who was the most respected rabbi. But so he, he's and he's gifted in not only. Hebrew, but he's gifted in the scriptures. But he's not only gifted in Hebrew and scriptures, uh, and the scriptures. He's also incredibly gifted in the language of the Greeks. So he is this perfect person to be chosen. But everywhere he went, he was out there publicly arguing with people. I mean, he was making a case. Doesn't yep. he indicate that mm -hmm. he was doing that? And they did that more. They could, you know. They would go and have this discourse about gods and faith and religion. Sure, people were definitely open so to he it. Was but he's, you're right. He's an in incredibly, incredibly gifted, gifted man. Uh, and again, I, when I talk to my Arminian brothers, I'm like, uh, so you're okay with Paul being chosen? I know. Well, he, I mean, he wasn't really chosen. Oh, so you believe Paul could have said no when he was blinded? Probably. Well, look, that's different. Right. Okay. All right, so sanctification carries with it the idea of already and currently occurring and not yet. All three are inherent in this concept of sanctification. The Greek word is to be set apart. Please underline that. The idea of sanctification is holiness. It is set apartness. It is the idea that you have been set apart by God. You have been carved out by God. Okay? It's a really, really important concept. Because if you look at your life right now and you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm there. I did it. I am sanctified. <laughs> you probably have some issues. On the other hand, you are sanctified. You are there, and it has been done for you. There's a difference in the language there, isn't there? Okay, so it's important we understand this concept of sanctification. So there's three types that theologians have identified. The first one is what we call positional sanctification. Somebody has a visitor at their house. I know that sound well, because I thought it was my phone, not yours. So, um, Okay, positional sanctification. Now, catch what I'm saying here. This is the, <laughs> this is the indicative of sanctification. Right? The indicative is what? It's a statement of fact. You are sanctified. The believer has been set apart by God as a member of God's holy people through the work of Christ. The believer is identified as belonging to God. Believers are identified as saints. Like, again, just... And, and I don't... You know, I, it's unfortunate when you study Romans that this is what you have to do, I guess... Uh, I really don't try to ever make... I'm just not the guy to stand up here and make Calvinist, Calvinist, Calvinist. I'm just not that guy. But I'm okay if Paul makes those arguments. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a reality here. And the reality is, this idea that you were set apart. You were cut out of the herd is really the idea of positional sanctification. You have been moved out. I mean, there's just a very clear language here. Okay? So, Andrew Snyder says this, Justification is the declaration of righteousness that makes the sinner acceptable to God. You are righteous. Positional sanctification is the determination by God that the justified sinner is now set apart unto himself as one of God's holy people. You've been declared righteous. You've been set apart. 
you've been declared holy. The righteous component is justification. Being called holy. Again, the word holy means to be set apart. To be called holy, to be called set apart, is the sanctification end of this. Okay? Very important. So here we go. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. I'll read this for you quickly as our time wanes. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit. It's already happened, right? It's positional. 1 Corinthians 6.11 And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. Past tense. Something that this is something that happened in the past. This is an aorist indicative word. This is at an event at past time. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Notice the use of both verbs. You were sanctified and you were justified. Clear distinction, yes? Okay. Colossians 1.13 He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. Again, the language of sanctification. Being cut out of the herd. Being set apart. Those of you guys that are ranchers or mutton farmers, like you understand... Not Some of you are processing that phrase right now. I object. You understand the idea of being cut out from the herd. That is the idea of sanctification. And look at Hebrews 10.10. 10. The author of Hebrews says, and by that, and by that will... We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So the sanctification was a one-time deal. Do you get that? So, this is the idea that you are positionally sanctified before God because of Christ's work on the cross. I'm going to just hit these other two. We'll go through them next week. The second one is progressive sanctification. This is the idea that you are... You don't act very sanctified. I don't act very sanctified. Right? I've slept a total of eight hours in the last two nights. Okay? It's busy time. Eight hours, two nights. Somebody cuts me off on the way to church. There's a good chance I'm not going to act very sanctified. That I have to be cautious. Truth? Right? Like... Uh, I, we, we need to understand this concept. We're not there yet. We are on the path. And that's what Romans 6 often is talking about. In fact, if you think about the last couple of verses that Brian read today, um, verses 12 to 14, 12 to 14 are this kick in the backside. Let's go. Be holy. You knuckleheads. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Right? Shall, shall we continue sinning? That grace may abound? No! What are you, dumb? By the way, that's actually what verse 2 says. Are you ignorant? That's, that's the actual translation of it. Okay? So, like, let's go, people. That's progressive. That's progressive sanctification. Continuing to grow in our faith. Continuing to crucify the flesh. Right? As we grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But then there's also an ultimate sanctification or a final sanctification when we receive our glorified bodies. Right? At the resurrection. Uh, and I just want to share with you, because if you're like me, and you've struggled in your life with sin, where you've sinned and you're like, oh, I'm so dumb, why did I do that? Mm -hmm. You're all nodding. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what, how does Vody Bakum say it? It's either amen or, uh, I don't remember what he says. What's that? It's, he says something like, 
if you ain't amen and you better I'm gonna find it and get back to you okay <laughs> kind of, that felt really flat when you weren't able to finish it but Revelation 21 27 but nothing in clean will enter into it what's Revelation 21 27 about heaven nothing unclean will enter into heaven we just read Romans 8, 38 and 39 that nothing will separate us from the love of God. Nothing. Not a thing. And Revelation 21, 27 tells us that nothing, nothing unclean will enter into it, heaven, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That means for those of us that are written in the Lamb's book of life, which is accessed by faith, Right? For those of us that are in the book of life, those of us that are saved, those of us who, if we're honest, struggle with sin and we're like, why? Why? Why does it... Ah! Remember that there's a hope. There is an ultimate sanctification. There's a final glorification and sanctification of who we are. We will be in heaven. And there is nothing detestable that enters into heaven. You will make it. It may be difficult. There are times when you're stumbling, you feel like you've taken a couple of steps backward trying to climb this slope, but you will make it. And you will make it through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And you will make it through the glorification of the body um, in the resurrection. Gary. I want to go back to Arthur's <coughs> comment earlier. Yeah. What he said to me should not be considered offensive. He's just really kind of paraphrasing 2 Corinthians 13.5. Talks about examine yourself to see what you be in the faith, Christ is in you, and let you get the test. To me, what he was saying was simply what 2 Corinthians 13. It should not have been a light job. It's, it's unfortunately a sign of where the church is that it was a light and I, I don't disagree. And the me back to the Jewish comment about Paul when he was still a Pharisee. Paul had not yet written Galatians chapter 3. He uh -huh. talks about the law was a tutor to lead us to yep. Christ. Because the Lord took him after conversion into the desert and taught him. So he had a clear picture of the gospel. Yep. He wasn't preaching the God. He was preaching the gospel of works according to the law and the old covenant. Yep. Not Which the is the law that Gamaliel taught. Yeah. He, yep. missed, he missed the part about Christ. Yep. Until it was converted. Amen. So, Kevin, okay. is this why it's important for us to keep reading the Bible? Because it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer, and you can start seeing the continuity and start putting these things together in your own mind. I have planted Virginia to ask such questions. <laughs> yes, you're exactly right. Yeah, you're exactly right, Virginia. I, I think that's key. Um, and I think, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not a Hebrew or Greek scholar. I need to rely on the work of others. There are people out there who tell you, no, don't do that. Well, it, okay. If, if you can interpret the Greek... I can tell you this, just because it was an interpreted, interpreted into English doesn't mean it was interpreted uh, in a way that, that was characterized by the original Greek. So, yeah, yeah, yes, please, study. By the way, uh, I just heard this crazy stat that said that um, uh, this is going to really come as a shock to you, that it, for people who read their Bible once a week, it had very little impact on their lives. For people who read their Bible twice a week had very little impact on their lives. But if people read their Bible four days or more a week, it had a tremendous impact on their lives. That's shocking to me that we have to do surveys to figure that out. I mean, it kind of falls into the category of duh, right? Like, but yes, I would agree. That's what we should be reading. Let me pray us out, and uh, I've got a couple minutes before I go watch film. Um, with the guys, so so feel free to come talk to me if you want to.